Hello and welcome to this and uh, my lesson on modeling linear growth and decay. My name is Darren from Asguru. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, it's a pleasure to be able to do this um, and hopefully help you smash your year 12 general maths course. Before I get into this, can you do me the favor, please, of subscribing to YouTube? That little click from you just lets me know that people are actually watching and that I'm not sitting in a room going ever so slowly mental. Um, although some would argue I've already got there. Oh, I'm on TikTok as well, but like you are way too old to use TikTok, aren't you? Uh, anyway, one of my learning objectives to be able to graph the terms of a linear sequence, a growth decay sequence, to be able to model simple interest. Okay, we've started hitting the financial words now. Simple interest, loans, investments, recurrent relationships, all right? What else else? Uh, model and analyze flat rate depreciation unit cost depreciation. Finance is huge and being able to understand the groundwork for these particular courses is going to let you smash your finance left, right and center. But I want to recap. In the previous lesson, I told you that pretty much everything you are going to deal with has a general format of a V0, a start term for a recurrence relation. And there is a huge difference between a recurrence relation and a rule. All right, and I'm going to come to that a little bit later on. But this is a recurrence relation. The reason it's a recurrence relation, it starts with V0 equals. It has a comma. There is a V of N plus 1 and a V of N. The rest of it is just dealing with linear growth and decay and geometric growth and decay. All right, so if this value here is a 1, it will always be linear growth and, or decay. And if this value here isn't a 1, then it will have some form of geometric growth or decay, all right? Depending on whether we have this value of D. If you don't understand any of that, go back and watch the video on mathsguru.com. Totally free to sign up and absolutely there for you to help, or for me to help you smash this. Now, linear growth and decay. As I say, this value of R, when it is 1, then it basically will change into a formula that looks like this. So then when this value of R becomes 1, our formula just changes to V0 equals P. And P stands for principal. It stands for my start amount, my start number. Whatever the context of the question is, V of N plus 1. To get to my next term, take my current term and either add or subtract a common difference. Right? So that plus minus there just is an easy way for me to write two formulas and say either add on or take away. So as we say in the previous lesson, we had some examples of some recurrence relationships here where we had a start value of 10. To get to my next value, take my current value and add 5. So my sequence there would they have to give you a start value for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and so we go on. And then again, we have this sequence here that says start at negative 3. And to get to my next term, take my current term and subtract 6. So in that situation, I have minus 3, minus 9, minus 15, minus 21, and so it goes on. Now, being able to read these things, very, very important, particularly with the finance stuff. But also, how do we know it's linear? Well, we can graph it. We can put it on a graph. And here, guys, I've used my trusty Desmos.com to enable me to actually graph this. So in this situation here, that is my value of n, and here this is my value of vn. We'll come back to that a little bit later on with the notation, but graphs should always have axes labels. And so in this situation, we know to start with our v0 is 10. So when n is 0, and that's this value here, we're going to put 10. Now, the problem I have here is I've actually stuffed up the question and I've actually, for some reason, started it at five. I really do need to correct that and I'll do that for a different video. But the point of it is here, I've actually seemingly started with the number five. We can do that, it's not a problem. Now what you'll notice on my graph is that the points are, well, green, but when you draw these things in an exam, you have to make them accurate. If this point here, if you're trying to draw the point 110 and it isn't exactly on the graph, you're not going to get the marks. If you draw a graph in pen, you're probably not going to get the marks. You have to draw graphs in pencil and with a ruler. Now again, if you're whinging, sitting there going, oh, I haven't got a ruler, a pen, that's really on you guys. I'm really, really sorry. Get out there, go to Officeworks, buy rulers, buy pencils, buy a rubber. Make sure you've got all that stuff. Because if you try and sit this exam and do graphs, without a pencil and a ruler, you are going to hemorrhage marks. And it seems to me a very, very silly thing to throw marks away. But again, going back to this, what we noticed was that when we were adding five on each time, then this line, if I was to be able to draw it in a sort of 
uh, presentation tool, then that would be beautifully straight. Likewise, if I have here something that starts at 30 and then goes down six, I would end up with something that looks like that in terms of decay. So we can graph these things, wonderful. All right, again, when you do this, I'm gonna have an example here of where I graph it, but we are now going to do one here where we have V0 equals two. So this is my N value. And this is my V of N value. So when N equals zero, our first start value is two. Now, uh, the reason I'm doing this is because when I did uh, the exam solutions uh, for pretty much the first time I did the exam solutions. So when VCAR released the further maths exams, I try and do the exam solutions to give you an example uh, or give you an indication of how well you've done, All right? It also tests my brain, but I put it out there going, yeah, maths guru, I don't make mistakes. Oh my gosh, did I make a mistake? And the mistake came with the graph. Right? I had to draw a graph, I had to plot some stuff on a graph. And my brain stupidly thought that each distance of those little lines there was one unit. And it wasn't. Because if you think about it, I've got a gap of 10. So that goes from 20 to 30. There are five gaps. Each of those gaps must be two. And it is so easy in the heat of an exam to make a silly mistake. Whew, I never did that again. Yeah, I did. So this one here, I'm going to start at two. So I would have to do a clear dot exactly on two. All right, now to get to my next number, I add on six. So for every one number across, I'm gonna move up six. Now that means three of those spaces. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, there is my next. So one across, I'm gonna go one, two, three spaces. Across, three spaces. Now, what does it say? For each of the following lists, the first four terms. Now, because it's only the first four terms, I need four dots. And ka -ching, I've done it. You will notice that my dots are accurate. If you are slightly off by, say, half a square off, just because you are literally just stabbing points everywhere, you're not going to get the marks. Now, making a mass real, simply interest, which should be simple interest, but we'll worry about that one later. Now, basically, simple interest is uh, calculated on your initial investment. So if I paid in $1,000 into my bank account at an interest rate of 10%, what the bank does is say, okay, well, this is what you've opened the bank with. I'm gonna give you 10% of that amount every single year in interest. So the bank will say, well, okay, I'm gonna work out 10% of 1,000, which is 10 divided by 100 times 1,000. And so I'm gonna give you $100 in interest every single year. Now, to me, that's a huge con, but simple interest is always quoted as a percentage per annum and you will need some sort of opening amount, be it an interest, a loan, an investment, whatever. Now, in this situation, when we look at my formula, remember everything is driven by my recurrence relationship, P is gonna be my opening amount, how much I open my bank account with, how much my loan is, whatever. V of N plus one is gonna be my next payment. V of N is my current payment. This D here stands for the simple interest. So now it's the context of the question. Interest is always added on. So I'm now changing this formula to make sure that it only has the plus in it because interest always added on. Finding the value of D, well, as I say here, if my interest rate, say I had, what was it, $200 at 8% interest, then what I would do is I would do eight over 100 times 200, and that would give me $16. Now that's very specific, isn't it? I've got an interest rate here and an opening amount. Well, what do I notice? I notice my interest rate, that eight, goes on top of a divide by 100, and this $200 seems to sit over here on a times. Well, that's a general rule. We can make that now a general rule to say our interest rate, our D, or our simple interest, is given by R, my rate of interest. So that eight, there's my R, divided by 100. There's divided by 100 times V0, my initial amount. So this here can become massively important. Here's an example. Now, in many cases, they're not gonna give you all of this information here. Cambridge are just being nice. And thank you very much, Cambridge, for allowing me to use your textbook examples. I'm very, 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 very grateful. Shell invests $5,000. So the first thing I know is my V0 is 5,000. In an investment account that pays 4.8% per annum simple interest. Now, per annum just means per year. So this now is my value of R. So my little value of R is 4.8.
How do I work out my value of D? Well, again, the textbook has been very, very helpful by letting you know here that therefore my D, my simple interest is gonna be my R, 4.8 divided by 100 times my initial investment. Well, I can't do that in my head, so let's fire up my calculator. And again, if you've got the class pad, you guys uh, know that uh, the functionality is pretty much the same. So 4.8 over 100 times 5123, hit enter, it gives me $240. Now, is that the answer to my question? No, because it says model the simple interest investment using a recurrence relation. So I've actually got to write this now using a recurrence relation. So V0 is equal to, well, we know V0 is 5,000. We have to do the comma. We then go that V of N plus one is equal to V of N. Are we adding it on or are we taking it away? Well, it's interest, so we're adding it on. So we're gonna add 240. And in a VCAR exam, that there is worth two marks generally. One mark for getting that bit right and one mark for getting that bit right. Hold on a moment, this looks very familiar. Well, absolutely, they've given you now and they've gone, well, okay, so in a sack, this might be on the next page. Um, and they've gone, well, okay, Cheryl's investment is modeled by that. <laughs> really, it's just a way for you to check. And I notice plus 240. But later on, you're gonna have to backtrack on that as well. You're gonna have to understand how to take that 240 and turn it back into an R value. But that's beyond this. Use a recurrence relation to show that the value of Cheryl's investment after three years is that much money. Show that. In a VCAR exam, when it says show that, you have to show all your lines of calculation. And sadly, guys, it's worth one mark. All right, again, if you don't want to do it, don't do it, but don't expect to get the mark. And this is, again, where people hemorrhage marks. They lose marks left, right, and center. Right, so the first thing you do, when you show that, and it's very specific and it's working out, you say that V0 is equal to 5,000. What you then have to do is you say V1 equals, and you actually have to write this out long way. So you have to say, well, therefore, V1 is 5,000 plus 240, which equals 5,240. V2 equals, what you do now is you take that value 5,240, and I add on 240, which is going to give me 5,480. And it wants at the end of three years, V3. So again, you say 5,480 plus 240, which is gonna give me 5720. Now, again, because I want to, I'm just gonna actually check by bringing my calculator that I've got these right by using the, uh, the working out I've done before or the recurrent stuff I've done before. So if you remember, put in 5000, hit enter, then do answer, plus 240, one, two, three, five, seven, two, zero. Now again, I'd rather check than actually make a silly mistake. So that is the value of the investment after uh, three years. When will Cheryl's investment first exceed $6,000 and what will its value be? Well, okay, well, I've already done the hard work here. So after three years, it has 5,720. After four years, 5,960. And after five years, 6,200. So therefore, the answer there would be five years. And we would say she would have 6,000. $200 ka-ching. Again, using the CAS is gonna make your life a lot, lot quicker and easier. Now, depreciation in maths means that we are losing values. When things depreciate, it's actually going down in value. All right, so driving a car off of a forecourt, for example, we'll see it lose value. It depreciates each year. Now, generally speaking, it depreciates by a percentage, but for now, we're gonna say, there's something in maths called flat rate depreciation. So as I say here, flat rate depreciation is where it goes down by the same amount every single year. Unit cost depreciation is where things go down by the amount they are being used. So a photocopy, for example, will lose money per copy. So that's what we call a unit cost. A lawnmower might lose value every time it's used, etc. There's lots of examples, I'm sure, but I can't think of any good ones. Now, with flat rate depreciation, we notice that the formula stays pretty much the same, except the plus D becomes a minus D, because when we depreciate, we go down by amount, right? So depreciate goes down. If it's flat rate depreciation, like simple interest, it will reduce based on its start value. So again, flat rate depreciation looks at the value it had when it started, and then it reduces it 
by some rate. Very similar to simple interest, but now we're just going to reduce by that value. Let's look at some examples. A new car was purchased for $24,000 in 2014. The car depreciates by 20% of its purchase price each year. Right, so it depreciates by 20% of its purchase price. Well, let's work out what its 20% of its purchase price is. So we want 20% of $24,000. So that's 20 divided by 100 times 24,000. Can't do that in my head, so let's do that on my calculator. So do 20 divided by 100 and times 24123 gives me $4,800. So every single year my car is going to lose $4,800. But again, it doesn't want us to do anything exciting other than write it as a recurrence relationship. Right, well, we can do that. So we know recurrence relationships start with V0. The principal was how much the car cost, 24,000, comma, V of N plus one equals V of N minus, and in this situation, $4,800. Let's actually just for the notes, make this section move over a little bit so that it makes life a little bit nicer. And there we go. Again, in a VCAR exam, you get one mark for that and probably one mark for that as well. Oh, look, that looked wildly familiar. V0 equals 24,000. V of N plus 1 equals V of N minus 4,800. Use the model to determine the value of the car after two years. Here we don't have to show the working out. So in which case we've got V0 is 24,123. How am I going to be able to do this? Well, I'm going to fire up my calculator and I'm going to say, right, 24000. And then I'm going to do minus 4800. Hit it once after one year, hit it again after two years. So therefore, V2 would be equal to $14,400. Nice and easy when your calculator, if the car was purchased in 2023, in what year will the car's value depreciate to zero? Okay, well, we can do that. So here, is 2023, 2024, 2025. So I'm just going to keep hitting it. 2026, 2027, 2028. So therefore, as far as I'm concerned, my car will depreciate in 2028 and have a value of zero. What was the percentage depreciation? Now, to find the percentage depreciation, and there's a lot of questions to do this, it is always the value of D divided by Z, D0. So our percent, get rid of my calculator, depreciation is equal to my value of D divided by V0 times 100. So what is my depreciation? 4800 divided by 24000 times by 100. Now weirdly, when I put it into my calculator, guess what I get out? 20%. How do we know it was 20%? Because it was told in the previous part of the question. But I've seen this in SACS over and over again, where they will ask you to find the annual rate of depreciation. Unit cost depreciation, as I say, is exactly the same as flat rate depreciation. It is exactly the same formula, but generally speaking, D now is a reduction in unit cost, right? So how much it reduces per unit. A professional gardener purchases a lawnmower for 270 bucks. The mower depreciates in value by 350 each time it's used. So that there is a unit cost depreciation. Model the depreciation value using this recurrence relationship. We can do that. So we now know that V0 equals, well, how much was my lawnmower bought for? $270, comma, V of N plus 1 equals V of N minus 3.5. Because every use it's going to lose 3.5 or $3.50. Ka-ching. Use the model to determine the value of the mower after it's been used three times. So it wants V3. Again, fire up my calculator, put 270 in. Answer minus 3.5. We want one, two, three. There we go. So the value of my lawnmower after three uses is $259.5. Yes, that's what we put. Nope. Your calculator is stupid, if you don't mind me saying that, and it doesn't know that we're dealing with money. And money always has two decimal places, so you would have to put the trailing zero in there as well. How many times can the mower be used until its depreciated value is first less than $250? Okay, so how many times can it use? Well, we've already got this is three uses. So I'm just going to hit, hit hitting enter. Four, five, six uses. 
right? So in that situation, six uses, because this is the first time my value falls below $250. Here are some VCAR questions. Sam owns a printing machine. The printing machine is depreciated in value by Sam using flat rate depreciation. Okay, again, so when we saw this in an exam, we would know that it's going down by the same amount each time. The value of the machine in dollars after n years is given by, so it obviously starting value is $120,000. To get to my next term, I'm taking away well, $15,000. Okay, by what amount in dollars does the value of the machine decrease each year? That was nice and easy, $15,000. So in this situation, I would write $15,000. ka -ching. nice easy mark. They do get harder than this for VCAR, I promise. Sienna is a coffee shop. A coffee machine purchased for 12,000 is depreciated in value using the unit cost method, okay? So the unit cost method. The flat, the rate of depreciation is 0.05 per cup of coffee made. Now again, trick here is that the VCAR exams generally like to change the units. You're very lucky in this particular question, or they were lucky this year because they gave it in terms of dollars and dollars. The recurrence relation that models the year-to-year -year value in dollars of the coffee machine is given by this. So that obviously must be how much you purchase it for. Yes. What is this? To get to the next price point, take the current and take away $14,000, sorry, $1,440. Calculate the number of cups of coffee the machine produces per year. Well, hold on. This is the value per year. So it's lost $14,000, oh, sorry, I keep doing that, $1,440. And every cup of coffee costs five cents. So if I now divide that by five cents, it should tell me how many cups of coffee I've got. So if I do 1440, and I'm going to divide that by 0 0.05, it tells me whew, that the number of cups of coffee is going to be 28,800 cups of coffee. That is a lot of cups of coffee. Nidhi owns equipment that is used 10 hours per day for all of the 365 days of the year. The value of the equipment is depreciated by Nidhi using the unit cost method. The value of the equipment is given by this. All right, so this is the original cost of the equipment. That was $100,000. And it would appear that each year it's losing $5,475. The value of the equipment is depreciating by. Okay, so dollars per hour. I'm going to look at that one first. So if I want the number of dollars per hour, this is the number of dollars. So five, four, seven, five dollars divided by it. Now I want the number of hours. Well, if it's used 10 hours per day for 365 days, 3,650. So I'm going to work that out on my calculator. Five, five four, seven, five divided by 3650 gives me 1.5. So $1.5 per oops, yep, hour. Now, as it turns out, A is the correct answer because the units and the calculations worked in the sense of when I did the calculation, the cost divided by the number of hours, I did get $1.50 per hour, right? But if I had basically divided, if I had done 5, 4, 7, 5, divided by 365, that would be my cost per day, because there are 365 days, yeah? So again, if I bring up my calculator and do 5475, and I divide that by 365, I get $15 per day, all right? So that there would be $15 per day, but do you notice there is no option for $15 per day? So by luck, this turned out to be A, but again, it was a thinking question. And there we go, guys. That's the end of this video. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully it's been useful. There are more videos in the series coming up. I look forward to seeing you in those. If you can, subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on TikTok, and uh, just say hi if you see me in and around Melbourne. But for now, take care. Please stay safe.